Hello, Castle Hills Church of the Nazarene. Welcome to the online worship gathering this morning, and happy Father's Day. To our fathers, to the men who have given of themselves for others, and who are role models, we want to recognize you this morning. We want to give you a virtual handshake and a pat on the back, and say thank you for all that you do, and for all that you mean to us. Let's come together this morning in prayer. God, our Father, thank you that we are gathered together in spirit at this moment to worship you and to submit ourselves to your care and to your purposes. Let us know your presence today and speak to us through your spirit, your word, and your people. This Father's Day, we ask in a special blessing today on the men of our church family. Give them your direction and empower them to be your agents. Make them more like you. Bring them often to our thoughts and encourage us in prayer for them. May they know they are loved and appreciated. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father, we come to you with praise and thanks for your sustaining grace. We linger, Lord, leaning hard into your embrace, knowing you love and welcome us during times of joy and in times of weariness and woe. Thank you for being our strength and song in these uncertain days. Give us rest, Lord, and restore our souls. Renew our minds so we will be refreshed. Give us courage to trust your ways as we surrender our lives to you. Make us a peculiar people, Father, so people will see your beauty and feel safe. We relinquish our worries into your care and open the anxious places in our minds to your spirit. Heal our brokenness, Lord and give us hope, forgive our sin, and cleanse us. We trust you, Lord, to heal the sick and bring strength to the weak. Thank you for many answered prayers. May your wisdom and compassion guide every leader. Shine your light in dark places, Lord. Render justice for the afflicted rescue the abused, reassure the vulnerable, and use us as your willing hands and feet. And may we respond to needs with generosity. On this day, we lift every father to you, Lord, and ask for your blessing in their relationships. Thank you for all the godly men who inspire and encourage us. 
may we also spur one another on to doing good. All glory to you, God. May your kingdom come, your will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. We give you all the praise, and we pray in the powerful name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run in with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My sons, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the the one he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight the path for your feet, for that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. This scripture will now be read in Swahili by Jean Malu Malu. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Leo nitasoma neno la Mungu katika kitabu cha Waebrania sura 12 mstari wa 14 mpaka 29. Neno la Mungu linasema, "Tafuteni kuwa na tafuteni kwa bidii kuwa na amani na watu wote na utakatifu ambao bila kuwa nao hakuna mtu ambaye atamuona Bwana. Angalieni sana mtu yeyote asishindwe kupata neema ya Mungu na muwe uangalifu pasiku pasibuke chuki ambazo kama me, mea mwenye sumu inaweza kukua ikaleta matatizo na kuwachafua wengi hakikisheni kwamba miongoni mwenu amna washirati au mtu asiye mcha Mungu kama Esau ambaye kwa ajili ya mlo mmoja aliuza haki yake ya kuwa mzalimu au ya ku ya kuwa mzaliwa wa kwanza maana mnafahamu ya kwamba baadaye alipotaka kurithi ile baraka aliyokuwa apewe alikataliwa maana akupata nafasi ya kutubu ingawa alitafuta kwa machoza sura 18 na la Mungu nasema akumjua aku akuja kukaribia mlima ambao unaweza kuguswa na ambao una wa, waka moto wala amkuja am, kwenye giza uzuni na dhuruba na mli, mlio wa tarumbeta na sauti ikisema maneno wa kiasi ambacho wale waliosikia waliomba wasi wasiambiwe neno lingine zaidi Ishirini, kwa maana hawakuweza kustahimili amri iliyotolewa kama hata mnyama atagusa mlima huu atapigwa mawe Ishirini na moja, kwa hakika waliona walikuwa walikuwa ya 
kutisha kiasi kwamba Moze alisema ninatetemeka kwa hofu 22 lakini ninyi mmekuja kwenye mlima wa Sioni na kwenye mji wa Mungu aliyai Yerusalemu ya mbinguni ambapo wamekusanyika kwa shangwe maelfu na maelfu ya malaika 23 mmefika kwenye kanisa la wazaliwa wa kwanza wa Mungu ambao majina yao yameandikwa mbinguni mmekuja mbele ya Mungu akimu wa watu wote na mbele ya roho za watu wenye haki waliofanywa wakamilifu mmefika kwa Yesu msu, msuluishi wa angano jipya na kwa damu ile aliyonyunyizwa inenayo maneno mema kuliko damu ya Abeli. Amen. Thank you. Happy Father's Day. Today's passage includes a quotation of Proverbs 3:1 through 11. The writer of the book of Hebrews includes this quotation to help the people that the book is written to to make sense of and move forward in their circumstances, to see the hand of God at work. It goes like this, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Hebrews 12:1 through 13, today's passage is actually the one that comes right before the passage I spoke on last week, but it's also a really great passage for Father's Day. It's a passage that we need to pay attention to. Sometimes when we read, we are honestly really quite lazy. We pick out a word and we assume we know exactly what it means and we pay little attention to how the author uses it or the context in which it's placed. This passage has the danger of doing that with words like discipline, correction, or punishment. We'll try to listen closely to the passage today. There are a couple of basic reactions that we might have to the parts about discipline. One, we could resent the fact that God would have us undergo discipline. Or two, we could rejoice that we're children of God, in whom God the Father delights, children that God intends to perfect in our faith. The writer of the book obviously thinks we should take up the second attitude and be pleased and encouraged to be God's beloved children. I'll look more closely at the first attitude and then we'll move on to the second better attitude. First off then, what does it mean here when the writer says that God disciplines us or even punishes us? I might say that we do things that deserve punishment. But that would take us in a direction that the writer of this passage simply does not go. We would be denying the clear meaning of the passage to claim that this is what the word punishment means in this case. There's no indication in this passage that God is trying to give us a deserved punishment for the sake of retributive justice. Retributive justice would say that God knows that we did something bad and did receive suffering in proportion to the severity of our wrongdoing. In this case, that is not the point. of discipline or suffering. Neither is there any indication in this passage that God wants vengeance on those who do evil. In the case you're wondering, this is not a new perspective on the passage. Early in the 5th century, Chrysostom wrote on the role of discipline in the book of Hebrews and he pointed out that it's not for punishment, vengeance, or suffering. None of those things are the point of God's discipline. So, if retributive justice or vengeance are not the point of discipline or punishment, then what is? This passage gives us an answer plainly and gives us examples that also make it clear. The outcome that God wants as we go through discipline is that we might share in his holiness a peaceful harvest of right living. Holiness is a beautiful and beautifully complex word. The basic meaning of holiness is separate The holiness of God that we might share in is that we are able to be separated from something. Uh, what God wants us to be separate from is the corrupted ways of the life of the world. These corrupted ways take the good things that God has made and twist them into something that they were not intended for. For example, God intends that we use the influence, blessing, and attention that we are entrusted with to extend his blessing to others. God intends for us to share his holiness in this way. We're supposed to be separated from the corrupted life in which we make an idol out of influence, blessing and attention and fearfully hold on to those things, always afraid that someone will take them from us. 
we are to be separated to, rather, God's ways of sharing blessing. This is the holiness and the right living that God intends for us. To be separated out from the corrupt ways we have before us as options in the world, and to be set apart as God's own people, God's own children, as this passage says. This is the life God wants for us and intends to give us. This passage is concerned with how the house church that received the book of Hebrews should live out this life where they were at. I think this passage translates very well for us today. It tells us how to live this life where we are at. So where are we at, according to this passage? What is going on in life that endangers the kind of trust that allows us to share God's holiness and to live this peaceful harvest of right living? We're in a place and a moment of suffering. The writer of the book of Hebrews compares this suffering to the discipline of a father. And now I'm finally getting around to the first response that we might have. We could resent the fact that God would have us undergo discipline. Discipline is not enjoyable. It's painful. We don't like it. I often perceive an attitude that suggests that God doesn't have any right to discipline us, as if it's an infringement on my right to self-determination. Now, for people who don't follow Christ, I'm not surprised by this attitude. We live in a world in which nothing is more fiercely held onto than an individual's right to self-determination. But for Christians, I hope this attitude is one that we can identify and move away from quickly. When we came to God because of Jesus, we did so with the admission that God has every right to direct our lives. In fact, it's what we ask God to do. Even so, I think there are times when Christians can resent God's discipline. We can show an indifference to God's discipline. We don't care that God is training us up for his good purposes. Indifference is one attitude that Christians are warned against in this passage from Hebrews. The other is discouragement. There are times that we start to see what this passage calls discipline as a cause to believe that God is displeased with us or that God has abandoned us. This is the attitude that the writer of the book of Hebrews has in mind and the one that this passage is written, written to help get rid of. As uh, writer Andrew Murray observed, if Christianity is to be a success, if Christ is to save completely, there must be a provision to prevent suffering from, cause, from causing discouragement or defeat, transforming it, suffering, into a blessing and help. This passage in the book of Hebrews is written to give us a change in attitude that transforms our perception of suffering from resentment, fear, indifference, or discouragement into one that sees how God can, can and is working like a father, disciplining beloved children. Discipline is not pleasant, but it is useful. I coached under 12 boys soccer before COVID-19, and hopefully I will coach again sometime here soon. If I am allowed to generalize, under 12 boys who turn out for competitive soccer like to play soccer. They want to get out on the soccer pitch and perform great feats of athleticism and skill. They're not always easily convinced that they have to practice in order to do well. Deep down, it's as if they are not convinced that practice is really necessary. They sometimes resent the discipline this life requires. Leg lifts and wheel runs are painful. They often lament that they found themselves in a place and a moment of suffering. They wouldn't have minded performing feats of athleticism and skill and winning matches, but they resented the very discipline that would allow that to happen. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. We can fixate on suffering when we experience it. Experience it. However, the writer of the book of Hebrews obviously has a different attitude that's available to us and is better. Knowing that the people for whom this book is written are suffering, the writer compares their situation to the discipline of a good father. I really think it's more of a comparison than a statement saying that God wants to punish them in the way that we usually think of it. Here's why I say that. Chapter 12 starts out by saying, look at the heroes of faith in the past. They endured through suffering. And the suffering that the book of Hebrews talks of is not suffering that the heroes of faith brought on themselves. It was suffering that came from opposition to their faithful lives. And then, chapter 12 says, look at Jesus. He endured suffering pressed on him by sinful people. It was not suffering that he brought on himself. These are the examples that lead into the discussion about the discipline of the Father. Retributive justice doesn't fit these examples. So the readers, and I should say we, should not feel as if God has abandoned us or is angry with us. This is a message of encouragement in the midst of suffering for the sake of God's kingdom, and it's not an accusation. It's an encouragement. Don't give up because of suffering. 
It's an encouragement, but that does not mean that suffering becomes easy. In suffering, we should think of ourselves as children who have a parent who intends for us to be trained up as a certain kind of people. God can use times of suffering to bring us to share in his holiness. That is the message of the scripture that we have read today. We can take encouragement in our suffering and not resent it or be discouraged by it. I use soccer as an example, but the athletic example used in the book of Hebrews itself is distance running. This is not a sprint, but an endurance race. These are important words for us today. We may be faced with a day-to-day -day and long-term context that includes suffering. We'll not just put out that single great effort of faith that solves the problems of the world. We should not expect that single breakthrough of understanding that makes everything make sense in such a world as we live in. Instead, we can take encouragement in a journey of endurance in which we have to put one foot in front of the other time and time and time again. We cannot drop out because it's challenging. We have to take the next step. We have to have the conversation in front of us today. We have to share the blessings we have been entrusted with, exercising faith that God will continue to care for us tomorrow. We have to step forward according to God's ways rather than to take a shortcut that promises to ease our discomfort but that does not show our faith in God. We're not just people floating through life, hoping to minimize our discomfort and live for today. We're children of God, and God is the Father who makes us more like Him. So press on. So take a new grip with your tired hands. Strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong.
everyone. We have just a few announcements this week. First off, we are making preparations to return to our face-to-face -face gatherings starting this next Sunday, June 28th. But in the meantime, we'll still be having our weekly prayer and scripture meetings this Wednesday, the 24th. And the times for those meetings are 10 a.m., noon, 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. If you'd like to reserve a spot, you can email castlehills.ministry at gmail.com or call 208 Three four five nine three five one. Ties and offerings can be mailed to the church, or you can use the online giving tab on our church website at castlehillsnaz.com. If you have additional offerings and you'd like to help some of those in our church family who haven't been able to work due to the pandemic, you can designate those extra givings as benevolence. We're continuing to pray for each other during this time. And if you'd like to submit prayer requests and needs, those can go to castlehills.ministry at gmail.com. And now in the words of Paul, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Have a good week.